Yoshitaka Moriyama was the creator of Japanese series Suikoden, which is ridiculously difficult to pronounce, and apologies if it's wrong, which is important for Aiden Chronicles Rising because Aiden Chronicles 100 Heroes, which is due to come out in 2023, is a direct sequel to that game, with slightly confusingly Aiden Chronicles Rising, this game, acting as a prequel to that sequel. If you're not thoroughly confused, then I salute you. It's published by 505 Games and is developed by Natsume Atari. But does this charming action RPG prequel sparkle like the games it descended from, another to be treasured, or is it destined for the scrap pile? Well, let's find out. The narrative follows a young girl called CJ. She's been sent out by her tribe, whose custom it is for the youngest to go and exceed the treasures discovered by their forefathers. In her case, she's trying to attain a larger lens crystal, which are dropped by powerful creatures, and this is her main and overarching narrative as you play through the story. CJ soon meets Isha and Garou, the former of which is a kangaroo with a rather bad temper, and the latter Isha is the acting mayor of the town. Narrative is the heart of any good RPG, and the storyline is serviceable enough and certainly serves to build intrigue for the main game, but it's the relationship between CJ and Garou which was the real star of the show here. The small quips, back and forths and arguments that take place really endeared me to both characters. In many ways, Euden Chronicles Rising reminded me of Sakuna of Rice and Ruin in its gameplay formula. It's a mix of genres, so we'll break it down into a few different sections. First and foremost, there are the quests. Now, the main quest's absolutely fine and has a good narrative backing. However, the side quest content isn't quite as refined. That is to say, you are literally handed a stamp card, as if you just strolled into the RPG equivalent of Starbucks, except rather than purchasing an average cup of coffee, you'll have to head out into the various dungeons of the world and collect something. It might be a mushroom, a piece of iron ore, a rare fish, or anything in between. That is to say, they are very fetch quest heavy. Fetch quests in and of themselves aren't necessarily a bad thing. However, some of these feel a little lazy. Now, on the flip side of that, I did enjoy the fact that most of the quests you undertake have some form of permanent impact on the town. It might help someone to rebuild their shop, from which you can purchase some new items or gear, and they're colour-coded so that some are personal requests shown in green and others shown with blue will always affect one of the parts of the town. In the game's defence, I didn't often feel the need to go off and complete the side quests exclusively, they were often completed just through the main quest as I explored those dungeons. It's also not a particularly difficult game, although this does ramp up on some of the later boss fights, so even though some of these quests will relate to getting new gear, it's not really essential. I might be alone on this, but I actually really liked the town and the people within it, and I was quite keen to rebuild it, but it doesn't change the fact that by its design, it's a very dated gameplay setup. Contrary to this then, is the action RPG combat. It has quite an interesting switching mechanic that relies on the player timing the button press, with each of the three characters being tied to one of the buttons, be it X, Y or A. When you tap it, they switch in and perform their ability. If you time it just right, you build up chains and combos which do much more damage. Unfortunately, you don't actually get access to all of them for a large chunk of the game. This is important because it's very fun when you've got all three, particularly as one of them has a ranged attack which makes it much easier to string these together. Now, each of the characters also has a special ability. CJ has a useful dash move to avoid damage with a red flashing indicator warning you when you're in peril. Guru has a block parry which must be timed at just the right moment, and Aisha, who has the ranged ability, can also teleport. It's a combat system that's fun enough so as to make fetch questing not feel like a difficult grind, but it's just too slow to mature over the adventure. There are a few boss fights in the game, and these are all relatively well designed, but they don't really emphasize the need for any one specific character, perhaps until the end when all three must be used together. Now, dungeon design is surprisingly good, and has almost a Metroidvania feel to it by the end. Again, the best systems just aren't mature until the last five hours of the game, such as certain elemental moves to clear previously inaccessible passages. You might find new treasure or gear, and the equipping of gear and items is straightforward enough, but again, the difficulty means it never really feels entirely necessary. Now, signposts break up the key areas within each dungeon. From these, you can save your game or fast travel back and forward, but there are two fast travel systems at play. There's one that takes place within dungeons using the signs, and then when out of the dungeon, there's another that allows you at any point 
to hit the minus button and simply travel to any of the locations within the town. And then finally, you can unlock the power of these ancient stones through a small puzzle minigame, which transports you and your friends to a new and unknown location, which is heavily tied into the narrative. Character leveling is very hands-off. As your player levels up by completing quests and getting more stamps on their card, they simply level with a number of statistics popping up over their head to indicate the improvements. Cosmetic upgrades are incredibly thin on the ground, although you can improve the efficacy of your weapons and enhance and change your items and runes. Regardless of its formulaic approach, it's still enjoyable, and the main reason for that being the well-written and enjoyable cast of characters. If you are, however, allergic to fetch quests, this is not the game for you. And while it's a nice idea that it builds up the town, when it doesn't make any real difference to the gameplay, it feels a tiny bit hollow. It scores 14 out of 20. The controls are let down by a couple of clunky animations, but they're still okay. They score 14 out of 20. Visually, the game's quite interesting. It feels like Natsume's answer to the 2D HD art style that Square Enix have been going for recently, and I personally really like it. Now, on the one hand, you have the pixelated main characters, and on the other, the 3D, sometimes quite vibrant backgrounds with that shallow depth of field look that gives everything almost a look of a diorama. There are real-time shadows cast from your characters, and although these are slightly lower res on the Switch version, I'd argue that it can still be quite a pretty game. On the flip side of that, though are the animations. We've seen this inverse kinematic style used in a few games recently, and while a complete stylistic choice, it's just not for me. It looks okay on the main character thankfully, but on Isha, it just looks janky. It gives it a cheapness that otherwise wouldn't have. Combat effects, performance and audio are good. In fact, the game has a very solid soundtrack. with different music tied to each area, and thankfully just when the main town music becomes tedious, it changes, so that was a bit of a relief. Performance is decent in handheld and docked, I didn't experience any crashes in my playthrough, and although I've not run it through framerate software, I think we're looking at 30 FPS. For the most part, load times are also acceptable, and text size also not a problem. Would I have preferred the characters to be voice acted? I think maybe yeah, but the dialogue is well written with a decent translation, meaning that nuanced jokes land right. Overall for me, I would give the visuals and performance 16 out of 20, and audio would also score 16 out of 20. Some of the misgivings of Ed and Chronicles Rising, in my opinion, are made up for in its price. Now it's priced at £12.99, which for my money is well worth what you're getting here. Yes, it's fetch quest heavy if you want to go down that route, but just for a charming little 15 hour story with some decent combat that certainly gets better by the end, and an introduction to the world and what comes next if you're a new player, well, I think £12.99 is reasonable. It's a 3.6 gigabyte download. There's a few secret areas and locations to discover, but it's very much a one and done experience in my opinion. I might be the minority in enjoying this one, regardless of its misgivings. And if I knew that going in, at £12, the value's okay. It scores 14 out of 20. CJ is the life and soul of the game. She is filled with the eternal optimism of youth and the inclusion of the much more relatable Guru really carried me through the game. To reiterate, if you don't like fetch quests, do not consider this game. However, if you can abide them and you like a good narrative, this might be worth considering. Overall then, it gets a switch up score of 74%. Let me know in the comments, what did you think of this one? I think it could have been much better, but actually I think it's going to get a lot of hate because yes, it's fetch quest heavy for the side quests, but as I say, most of them are optional and the narrative I enjoyed and it's 12 quid. So there you go. It's up to you. Let me know in the comments. Thanks to our patrons. You guys are amazing. Support us every single month and we have a new one. Absolute legend. And to all of you that watch the channel, leave comments and, and whatnot. It really is appreciated. Try and, uh, try and get through as many as I can and reply to as many of you as we can. All that's left to say then is for all things Switch, all the time, keep it Switch up. Cheers, guys. See ya!